Now, I'm sitting up here for a purpose, you know. What I want to know is, is what, what do you know about electricity? What electricity is? I wonder, can you tell me anything about electricity? It heats the cooker. It heats the cooker, does it? That's very good. And, and what do you say electricity does? It makes the television work. It makes the te Very, very good. Makes the television work. I can see you're anxious to answer. What is it? What do you think electricity does? It gives us heat. It gives us heat, does it? What, through an electric fire? Yeah. Aye, right, okay. And what, is it, what, what are you going to tell me about electricity? Give us all these lights. That's very good. I think I'd better go back down into my proper place now, hadn't I? Shall I leave that microphone there? Thanks, lads. Now, you realise, of course, what you've all been telling me is, is what electricity does, not what electricity is. And I wonder if you, any of you can tell me what it is that, about electricity that makes all those things work. Does A anybody? current. Currents, is it? I see. Does everybody else agree with him that it's currents? Yeah? Yes. Electric yes. currents. Shall we see if that's true? I've got some batteries here and, and uh, some wires and I've got a lamp. If I join this circuit up, look, that bulb lights, right? It can say I've got a current flowing through that circuit. And the secret was it was, was making the whole circuit. I've got a switch there. If I throw that switch, I've broken the circuit. It comes off. Put the switch back on. I've made the circuit again. All right? So the current is flowing through there. Now, if I put that balloon between these two bits of wire, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing. Is it? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, anybody else think it's nothing? Right? You're dead right. It's nothing. And do you know why it's nothing? Because That's right. Well, why can't it get through there? Because What's the balloon it's made of? Huh? It's full of air, yes. What else? Yes, air will stop the electricity going. What else? It's made of plastic. Plastic That's and right. rubber. Plastic and rubber, that's also an insulator. So what? Oh! Better get the rubber out of the way. Now, as soon as I rejoin, we've got the current back. Now, if we really want to find out, what electricity is, we've really got to go inside that sharp point of that wire, that piece of copper wire, and see what's going, to, going on in there. And we've got to become very, very small because the scale of things of happening is, is very, very tiny. Now, I wonder how many of you at the, at the shows have, have tried to count the number of beans in a jar? Have you? Well, I'm probably more familiar to you. I don't doubt most of you have been to the sea this summer. I bet I'm not as good at you, but I'll try and turn that into a sand pie. There you are. It didn't work, did it? There's enough sand pie there, anyhow. Now, anybody like to have a go and tell me how many grains of sand there are in that sand castle? One million. Go on. Anybody guess? One million. A million? Go on. And any Two other million. guesses? Two million. Huh? 25 million? 35 million. You're getting closer. 50 million. A bit closer. 26 million. No, no, million. not quite. No, we'll stop it there. There's actually 90 million grains of sand in that little pile there. So just imagine how many grains of sand there are on a typical seaside beach. Now let's measure out on that beach a, a piece a kilometre long and a hundred metres wide. Now this beach is actually a metre thick, so we've got a definite amount of sand to think of. Now how many grains of sand do you think you've got there? A thousand million? A million million. A million million? You're getting better. Getting better. You're getting very, very close there. Now, Walt, Walt, Walt here is a very kind chap. OK, he's a very kind chap. What he's done is written out the actual number in full on that piece of paper. Of Get a girl to help you, Jackie, Walt. Jackie, will you come huh? and help me with this roll? There? And roll it out in front there. Rather a big there. number. Now, if you could stand here and hold the end of my roll, that's it. Now, I'll go away and you'll see. What's that? Three thousand? Another thousand, another thousand, that's a million. Another thousand, another thousand, that's another million. Three thousand, million, million. That's the number of grains there were on that sandy beach that we saw there. But, that, thanks very much, Walt. That's an awful lot of, lot of grains of sand. But you remember this point on this piece of wire here that I broke the balloon with? That's about the same number of atoms as there are in that point of wire. Now, we've got a, a very special picture. It's taken with a, a, a very special microscope, one that's able to magnify by about two million times. And if you get a, a very sharp point, that's a picture of a point of platinum. 
And all those little bright dots on there, you can see the, the pattern of dots on there, are actually the little atoms in the platinum. But we're still a long way to go yet. I want you all now to take another great big deep breath. And, you know, we, often we think of atoms like that as little tiny solid objects, but really, if you look inside those, you find they themselves are a miniature universe, like a sun with planets running all the way around them. And in this case, we, we have a nucleus, uh, like this, with lots of little electrons running around in different paths, all around, orbiting around that nucleus. So we have a little thing, look rather like this, a sort of planetary system. There are lots of different sorts of atoms. You can see in this one here, there's the red nucleus, that one there, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, different electron tracks running the out, around the outside there. And the, the simplest atom we know anything about is, is that, you remember normally the things that make a balloon pop are hydrogen. Well, there is a, a model really of the atom hydrogen. One nucleus, one electron orbit there. You see the red nucleus and the one electron in orbit around it. Now, what the scientists found out was that the nucleus and the electrons running around there were charged with, with electricity. And by convention, we say that that nucleus carries a positive charge. And so that electron around the outside is, has got the opposite charge on it. Anybody like to tell me what the opposite of positive is? Come on then, quick, shout it out for the... Negative. Negative, that's right. So we have a positive nucleus and negative electrons running around the outside. So as long as the electrons are whizzing around at high speed, it, the attraction between the negative electrons and the positive nucleus is balanced by this spinning force, just like that. You imagine that as an electron on the piece of string. OK? So we've, we've got positive nucleus, negative electrons, lots of negative electrons all whizzing around in space at different levels from the nucleus. But I, I now want to bring you back from this very, very tiny scale back to the our normal sizes again for a moment. In nature, you often find things like this, if you're lucky. They're crystal structures. And you notice what regular shapes these have. This is the, one of the clues that we're looking for, that the atoms are, in fact, arranged in, in regular patterns. And you'll find that in, in many, many metals, the atoms are arranged on, on faces of a cube, rather like in this model here. You see there's an atom at each one of the corners of this model and one in the, each of the faces. That actually is the way in which the atoms in, in copper are arranged. But of course, when, when you get down into the real metal, they, the atoms do actually touch one another, so you have a, a model rather like that one. And can anybody remember how the electricity gets from there to these lights, or to you and me? Anybody remember? Come on, shout it out. Cables. Yeah. cables, yeah, cables, wires, whole variety of things like that. Do you know what cables and, and wires, here's a whole series of cables and wires. Any idea what they're made of? Copper. Copper. Metal. Yeah, there's some rubber on the outside, yeah. There's, there is some steel, yeah, there's some copper, there's some plastic on the outside, yeah. Which is the bit that does the work, though? Copper. That copper in the middle, you're dead right. That's the bit that conducts those electrons that we saw there to give us our electric current. Uh, but we need now to find out how these are organised. When the copper condenses into a metal, a hard piece of metal, the atoms are arranged in structures like that. Now, let's take a... To, you know, remember Alice in Wonderland when she wanted to get through that keyhole? What did she do? She took shrinking medicine, didn't she? So let's take some of Alice's shrinking medicine and she gets smaller and smaller and smaller. She sees these rows of, of atoms, and then, of course, she looks inside those atoms. She's small enough to get inside one of those, and we're back again to our atomic structure again with these electrons whizzing round the nucleus. Now, remember, copper has 29 electrons whizzing round the nucleus, and we can see their movements much more clearly if we now collapse those orbits into a series of circles. Some of the electrons are orbiting close into the nucleus, and some of them are orbiting way out away. 
But when you find that the copper atoms condense into a structure like this, you find that the outer orbit, the outer ring of electrons, the outer tracks of these various atoms overlap one another. So that outer layer of electrons there are free to roam between all of those atoms there. And approximately one electron from each atom is free to roam. Now, you might say, OK, big deal. How can such an unbelievably tiny little electron do anything significant? But what did we see about those grounds of sand and the number of atoms in the points there? How many atoms were there in the point there? 3,000 million million, wasn't it? That means we've got 3,000 million million electrons in that point there to do the job. Now what happens if I put a negative charge on one side? What would you expect to happen to the electrons? That's right, they run through the thing. Well, putting a negative charge on the one side there is, is put like putting a voltage on, putting a pressure on to drive the electrons across. So there we are, we've got electrons all drifting in the same direction, pushed by that pressure. Millions upon millions of electrons all carrying their negative charge, and that's what we call an electric current, a flow of electrons. And that's really where we get our electricity from. And that, of course, is measured in amperes. You remember the great French scientist Ampere who gave his name to the rate of flow of these electrons through the structure. Now, I've been using volts and amps quite, quite regularly so far. Has anybody got a good idea of what those words mean? How much power there is. Which is that? Is that the volts? No? No. No, it isn't, is it? If you put them together, they'll measure power, but Volts, pressure, volts measuring the pressure, the amount of push we give the electrons, amps, the, amount of volts. the number of electrons that are going, amps, the number of electrons that are going. All right, it's a bit difficult, isn't it? But what we've got to do is see how these volts and amps are, are related to one another. So what we did was called on the fire brigade to help us to explain this because as you increase the water pressure you'll push more water increase the electrical pressure the voltage you'll push more electrons you see the fire brigade running out the hose at the school and of course these pressures can be weak or strong when the fireman first turns on the hose there you see he's opening the valve to let the water in the pressure is quite low. See, look, the water is only just dribbling out of that hose there. The fireman is saying, turn the pressure up, increase the pressure up. You see, he's opening the valve some more. That pressure gauge is showing the pressure going up. Now, you watch the hose that the girl's holding. You see, the, the water pressure is getting harder. You can see it's actually pushing her. As the pressure gets harder and it pushes more water through. So the higher the voltage, the more amps we get, the more electrons that flow. Now, here's a tank with four pipes leading off it. The pressure of water, or the voltage if you like, is the same for each of the pipes. They're all the same distance down the tank. But the pipes are four different sizes, from big to small. Now if they all start together, which team do you think will fill its dustbin with water first? Let's see. You can't say they're not trying, but it, it's becoming obvious that the teams with the smaller pipes are much slower than the boys with the wider pipes. And the wide pipes are filling their dustbins very fast but the pressure's the same. So the smaller pipes must be resisting the pressure so that the flow or the current is smaller. But let's see, now the pipe's getting bigger. They're doing very well there. Now this is the team. We're coming up to the team with the, the biggest of the pipes. The biggest of the pipes. Let's see what they've done. Oh, they've won! They've won! The team with the biggest pipe has won. They've filled their dustbin in the shortest time. So you remember, a fixed pressure, the bigger the diameter of the pipe, and thus the less resistance to the flow of water, in a given time, we get a greater amount of water. Now, the same is true of our electricity pipe. You remember the little pipe I used there? Well, this is the electricity pipe that we often use to bring the power, the electricity from the power stations to us. And you see, big diameter pipes, less resistance to flow, more electricity runs through them. Now, we've gone back to that school again. What they're doing here, the master's got a, a layout of a filament, like an electric lamp filament, and the children there all represent the electrons. 
You see in a minute, they, they have little plates on their heads which tells you that they're negatively charged electrons. At the moment, they're all just sitting like those electrons did in the copper atoms in position. You see, they're all now showing their electrons free to move around in the thing. In a minute, you see the two of them will put up the word charge, put some pressure on, put some volts on, some electric pressure, and you see the electrons all start to move. The electrons that are all jostling one another, they're getting into trouble in that narrow section. The, 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 the fact they've put the electrons made them go red there, that represents the wire there getting hot. The resistance to the passage of those electrons is increasing. And that, of course, is exactly what happens in the filament of a lamp. You see, they're really getting excited there. In fact, some of them are taking a good opportunity to thump some of the neighbours. You see, as they come out of the narrow part of the pipe, the electrons calm down again and flow much more sedately through the thicker wire. In fact, you find the wire on the outside there is quite cool. Now, we have in front of us there a real filament. Now, that real filament, of course, is putting resistance to work. That filament is made of tungsten. It's a material which doesn't like electrons to run through it, so it has what we call a very high resistance, which is why you get the bright lights there. Now, we measure that resistance in, in the name of another very famous German scientist called Ohm. So we measure our resistance then in Ohm. And the Ohm, that is this connecting link I've been looking for all the while between these amps and volts. And so if we go back to our firemen again, just as the firemen, if they want to deal with a very big fire, they use their biggest hose, the highest pressure, to deliver the greatest amount of water in the shortest time. So electricity needs the high voltage and a low resistance to give the highest amps, the highest flow of electrons, to give us the maximum amount of electrical energy in the shortest time. Now, of course, in your home and practically everywhere else, every house in the country, it's this resistance which is heating those lights up there. Hey, well, has the toast done yet? Yes, of course, you, you can use it for cooking toast, or it's as the girl up there told me that... What's the matter with it, Holly? That's it, yeah. Anyhow, you say terrific stuff, this electricity. But with all, that all those electrons rushing around, all that electric power about, how do we stop it escaping? What was the, what's the equivalent of the hose pipe in electricity? What is it that's stopping all that electricity getting out? <laughs> Go on. Rubber and, rubber and plastic. That's right. Anything else? Rubber, plastic. Yes, right. They're all insulators, aren't they? And they... There, there are quite a, a lot of materials, just as there are a lot of materials like copper which conduct electricity, conduct electrons easily, there are a lot of materials like these rubbers and plastics which we call insulators that won't let those little electrons run through them. And th they really imprison, lock in the electrons within the wires. That happens with the sort of insulators that you hold your overhead lines up. If you look at an overhead line, you'll find normally it only has the bare piece of copper like that up in the air. This is because air is also an insulator, and we suspend the, these copper wires on insulator strings like you see there. But those really are designed to stop the electrons running down those pylons and coming to ground. Because, I don't know, one of the other things you probably know, that the human body is a very good conductor of electricity. And if you put too many volts and too many amps on the human body, then your heart stops beating there and you're dead. So that's what we have notices on the bottoms of the pylons which say danger 132,000 volts. Now 132,000, that's a lot of volts, isn't it? A lot of pressure. Does anybody know why we have that much pressure, that much voltage to push the electrons along from the power stations? Because the current has to go a long way. That's right, it is. It's usually what, 10, 20 miles or so from a power station around London to, to us here. So you go to a high voltage to make the, ele the electrons go a long way. But we certainly don't need that sort of voltage to make that toast, which Wally was desperately trying to make, or to even to boil an egg. So, a little earlier on, we were saying we could change the current by increasing the voltage or changing the resistance, we saw how to change the resistance by altering the thickness of the wire, of the metal. But how do we set about changing the voltage? 
what we normally say we have to do is we want to transform the voltage from a high voltage to a low voltage. So naturally we call them transformers. Those are the transformers you find at a power station, which operate at very high voltages. And that's the transformer you find normally outside the blocks of flats. But what we want to do is to find out what goes on inside those. It tends to look very complicated. You've got a little baby transformer on the bench there. And some of you, I guess, as you came in, noticed that statue of Michael Faraday, did you? Did you notice what he was doing? He was holding up Faraday's induction ring. And that really is the first transformer, Faraday's transformer. It's very simple, really. What Faraday did was made an iron ring. And he wrapped on that iron ring two sets of, of, of conductors, just like we've got here. If we get old Wally along to help us. Two conductors, one on this side, one on that side. That one's connected to this voltmeter to tell us whether there's any, any current flying through there. This one's connected to this battery. And do you remember what sort of thing happens? What Faraday would have expected? If you hold this current steady, nothing. If Wally flips the connection on and off, then every time he makes and breaks the current in here, then a little current appears on this side. Electromagnetic induction, Faraday called it. Very big words, a very basic phenomena, so easy once Faraday had found out how to do it. All right? Now, what we do here is if we pull that lead off, you saw we've got two turns on this side, two turns on that side. If we get this unmuddled, that's it, well, that makes three. Another one? Four. Yes. Four. Put it back in there. Now we've got twice as many turns on that side as we have on that side. Now watch that needle when Wally makes and breaks it. Anything happened to that? Wasn't the deflection greater when I'd got four, four on than when I'd got two? That's what a transformer is, all right? It's ever so simple a principle, the transformer. But you remember, if we want to make the transformer work, then we have to keep making and breaking the circuit. We have to keep switching on and off. When we do that, we're making the electrons flow one way and then the other. We call that, as you might guess, an alternating current. And what Wally's doing there is showing you a picture of that alternating current there, you see? A wave pattern. You can see that noise as he increases the frequency. See the bulb? 50 alternations, that's alternating current. 50 on and offs per second, 50 cycles. That's the normal, normal supply frequency that we get. But we can now get voltages of different sorts with these transformers. We have very high voltages, so we can get a lot of power into industry. When you come into the house, we only have to put small bits of power into the house, you know, to run that toaster, so we use low voltages. Now get onto that frequency changer wall. You remember I said 50 on and offs per second for the normal supply, but we can increase the frequency higher than that as Wally's doing now. If we get up to about a thousand cycles per second, then that picture there shows you an induction furnace. That's a, using about a thousand cycles per second. I don't know whether that's the right frequency for a thousand cycles per second to melt. If, okay, well, if we increase it again now to about a million cycles per second, we get a device like this, which is called a radio frequency generator. Has she switched on yet, well? Now, with a, one of the things that you, when you've got that sort of frequency, you find that the electricity that's in, that, that comes around there, you can see it lighting up that bulb, inducing a current in that flash bulb, but it also gets itself attracted to the water in that tea towel. And you see how the water's coming off? Can you see that tea towel steaming? That's one way of drying a tea towel. It's a very expensive way. If we go further than that, that was a million cycles per second. That's a million on and offs per second. We go to a thousand million off, on and offs per second. Then you've got your radar. Further again, you've got your TV transmission. And we go out in outer space and you see the galaxies and the stars receding. And you remember what we had there? We have lots of solar systems with planets running around the sun. And what did we have? There we are, back down to that electron again, the real basis of of all our electrical energy. And all that started here. And although I've spent most of my working life trying to find out more about electricity, there's still a lot more to find. 
ways in which you can see electrons at work and perhaps one of you out there will find something else about how electrons work. There's a tremendous lot to learn, so never take anything for granted and you might become as famous as Faraday and as useful to society. Thank <laughs> you.